Hi there, welcome to A Mystery in a Mess. I'm Amanda and this is my mess. Every week I pick a mess in my space to clean up and to entertain myself and hopefully you while I clean. I recount a true story. It's, sometimes it's true crime, sometimes it's weird history, sometimes it's wild science. Uh, I, any way you slice it, they're always stories that I find fascinating and sometimes horrifying. This week's story is the Boston Molasses Flood, uh, or as I am tickled to find out that it is called, the Boston Molassacre. Uh, the content warnings for the story include uh, drowning, deaths of adults and a couple of children, and the ever-popular corporate corruption. So, let's get cleaning. Our story. Picture it. Boston, Massachusetts, 1919, the tail end of World War I. It's January, and Boston's North End neighborhood is home to a large number of Italian Americans and munitions production, namely rendering molasses into munitions grade alcohol. Coincidentally, our molasses has migrated onto this shelf, which is not where it's supposed to be. But uh, here's a life hack for you. If you uh, store your molasses in an old ketchup squeezy bottle, it's a lot easier to use. I need to actually, can't wait for this ketchup to be gone because I need to replace this one. I broke the cap on it. Um, I know molasses isn't super common in kitchens these days. Um, at least that's the impression I have. But I really like it uh, because it's a great sweetener in a lot of things and it has uh, a little bit of extra nutrition. It's got some vitamins and minerals in it that you don't find in sugar. And in particular, it's really high in iron. So uh, while it's mostly known for gingerbread, like as an ingredient in gingerbread, I like to put it in um, pancakes and oatmeal. Um, there's a coffee creamer that I make with it. Uh, oh, and it's great in barbecue sauce. Uh, so anyway, if you want to use molasses uh, after you hear this terrible flood story, ketchup squeezy bottle. Anyway, the huge molasses tank in North End Boston was filled to capacity on January 15th, 1919. Molasses was in really high demand for munitions and also for alcohol production. And it said that alcohol processors were basically racing against the clock. Um, our story takes place on January 15th and the very next day, January 16th, 1919, is the day that the 18th Amendment for Prohibition was ratified and it would go into effect one year later. On the unseasonably warm morning of the 15th, a ship from the Caribbean topped off the tank in North End with, uh, with warm molasses, and the captain of that ship said that even well out to sea, uh, he and the crew could hear the tank groaning in complaint from the amount of uh, molasses that was in the tank. That said, those sounds were nothing new to the residents of North End. There had been complaints about the tank from basically, there had been complaints about the tank basically from the day it was built. Isn't this adorable? My oldest child made this for me in her ceramics class. It's the Deadly Nightshade uh, bottle from Nightmare Before Christmas. I love it. Anyway, there have been complaints about the tank basically from the day it was built. It creaked and it groaned. It leaked so badly that Purity Distilling Company, 
the corporation that owned it painted it brown to try to hide the leaks. Still, neighborhood children would uh, come by on an almost daily basis to collect the leaking molasses. There was even at least one employee of Purity, uh, uh, Purity Distilling who was on record as complaining about uh, the tank being unstable, but no efforts were ever made to test or repair the tank. Around lunchtime on January 15th, a sound like machine gun fire rang out across North End as the rivets shot out of the tank. Uh, and that was followed very quickly by a thundering boom and sort of rushing sound as the rest of the tank gave way. Uh, 80 feet away, the firefighters at Engine 31 Firehouse were playing a game of cards at their lunchtime, and they had basically no time to react as they saw a two-story tall wave of molasses rush toward them at about 35 miles per hour. The firehouse was knocked clean off its foundation and its second story collapsed down onto the first story. Across the street from the tank was the home of Bridget Cloherty. Uh, it's an Irish name, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, across the street from the tank was the home of Bridget Cloherty and her adult children. Uh, barman Martin Cloherty, her adult son, was sleeping in the home after an overnight shift at the bar the previous evening. And he says, um, I was on the third floor of my house when I heard a deep rumble. When I awoke, it was in several feet of molasses. Uh, he, uh, the Cloherty house was totally swept away by the wave of molasses and it was dashed against the steel train platform. It was totally swept away and dashed against the elevated train platform and destroyed. The wave of molasses had been so strong that it actually uh, knocked down the train platform in several places and bent the steel. It's just luck that there hadn't been a train uh, on that part of the platform at the time. So Martin McClarty, when he wakes up in this molasses, he manages to climb onto his bed frame nearby, um, though he did uh, nearly drown before he was able to do that. Uh, using his bed frame as a makeshift boat, he was able to rescue his sister Teresa, however, very sadly, his uh, mother Bridget McClarty and younger brother Stephen McClarty did not survive. Sailors from a nearby vessel, police, firefighters, and individuals from the neighborhood all rushed to the scene, but rescue was difficult. Molasses, at the time of this eruption, according to a study done at Harvard about um, this, this particular like gravitational flow type of fluid behavior, <laughs> um, molasses is one and a half times more dense than water and it cooled, um, and as it cooled, it hardened. So rescuers were trying to get people out they were stuck the rescuers were stretching ladders out over top of the molasses trying to get two people who were trapped but it was hard to tell uh even if the um the masses that were stuck in the goo were humans or horses or dogs so the rescue was slow going. At the Engine 31 Firehouse, several of the men from the lunchtime card game were trapped in a molasses filled um, pocket of space on the collapsed in first floor. And there was a dramatic and difficult rescue done, um, but it took several hours for 
Took several hours for rescuers to clear away the debris and cut through floorboards. And in that time, one of the firefighters became just exhausted fighting against the molasses and he uh, drowned. All told, when the tank exploded, it unleashed 2.3 million gallons in a tidal wave of molasses that was initially 15 to 20 feet high and traveling at about 30 miles per hour or 55 uh, kilometers per hour. And that flying wave of molasses uh, carried shooting rivets like bullets and swept along a mass of debris. Ultimately, 21 individuals were killed, including two children who were collecting molasses at the base of the leaking tank. And 150 more individuals were injured, many very seriously. In the wake of the disaster, oops, I got ahead of myself there. In the wake of the disaster, it's estimated that it took 87,000 man hours, or I'm sorry, 87,000 worker hours to clean up the molasses. And for weeks, uh, the quote that I read was, <laughs> everything a Bostonian touched was sticky. And I know how that goes. I mean, I've got kids. There are definitely individuals in this house where everything they touch ends up sticky. Mostly, uh, they hosed and shoveled and pushed the molasses back into the harbor. I mean, it's Boston. They throw stuff into the harbor. That's what you do, right? Um, and the water in the harbor remained dark brown from, uh, with molasses from January when this happened well into the summer of that year. All right, I am, so I've got this um, shelf area cleared off and apparently we're doing a lot of life hacks during this video. So first thing in the spring every year, there's always one morning where I wake up and there's just ants everywhere, sugar ants, those little tiny black ants. Um, we haven't had much of a problem with them since that one day because I ordered this very handy uh, peppermint oil, um, ordered it online and it repels ants and it doesn't hurt or kill them. So what I do is um, a lot of times when I clean the counter and then when I clean this shelf up here, which is actually where we keep the sugar and it tends to sometimes get sugar, I will just take my handy dandy kitchen rubber gloves here and get a little dab of the peppermint oil right on the end of the glove and just go right around the back edges of the shelf and that basically if ants do try to come around up here they generally will not cross this line of peppermint like I said, um, you know, we had one day in the spring where I woke up and there were sugar ants everywhere, so many. And since I got the peppermint, they've been totally gone. And honestly, it does not take very much peppermint at all. So anyway, I've got to stop saying so in these or I'm going to have to change the name of it to so a mystery and a mess. Uh, the Boston molasses flood was actually not the first molasses tank rupture flood in the U.S. Um, it wasn't even the first fatality from one that year, but it was by far the largest. Um, after the disaster, victims filed 119 different lawsuits, which were eventually combined into a class action lawsuit, which would turn out to be one of the largest class action lawsuits in history. There are actually 
So it turned out to be one of the largest class action lawsuits in history. There are 25,000 pages of transcripts from the loss uh, from the lawsuit in the archives. So what happened was um, the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, which uh, it, it was called Purity Distilling at the time of the explosion and then it was purchased by the United States Industrial, Industrial Alcohol uh, Company. Uh, they claimed that the flood had actually been caused by an anarchist bomb, which according to my husband, who's a history professor, is like just a thing they like to claim back then. It was either the Italians or the anarchists. Um, and they couldn't really blame the Italians in this case. So they claimed it was an anarchist bomb. Um, but... During the trial, during the they introduced over 1,500 exhibits and testimony from somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand witnesses, including explosive experts, uh, survivors from the flood, um, employees of the employees of the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation and ultimately uh, I should point out I say ultimately there was one other really impressive thing about this civil lawsuit and that is that the closing arguments in this case took 11 weeks just the closing arguments 11 weeks but after those 11 weeks of closing arguments, uh, State Auditor st State Auditor Hugh W. Ogden finally ruled that United States Industrial Alcohol was to blame for the disaster and not a bomb. Uh, he concluded that the company's poor planning and lack of oversight is what had led to the tank's structural failure. You see, it had come to light that Arthur Gell, the gentleman who oversaw the construction of the tank, neglected even very basic safety rules. He didn't even fill the tank with water after construction to check for leaks. He ignored all of the warning signs, all of the groaning noises, and the fact that the tank leaked every single time it was filled. Um, he also, when he was put in charge of this project, he had no engineering or architectural experience. Uh, um, a 2014 sort of investigation that they did at Harvard into the the engineering and the physics behind this disaster discovered that the steel used to build the tank was at most half of what it should have been and that's by 1919 standards um, and not only that but it was a kind of steel that did not contain magnese uh, which apparently it needs to have otherwise the steel is very brittle uh, and in addition to even that um, the rivets were, there was some sort of flaw with the rivets and the first cracks actually formed at the rivet holes. Um, in the end, the company paid out $628,000 in damages, um, which with inflation is around $9.26 million in 1919 or happened in 1919 in 2019 it would have been around uh 9.26 million dollars um and then the relatives of the individuals who were killed reportedly received uh just shy of seven thousand dollars per victim which came out to about one hundred and three thousand dollars per victim uh adjusted for inflation today uh it's still said that on hot days boston's north end smelled like molasses until the uh, mid 1940s 
Um, something else that I didn't mention that I feel like is really important when it comes to those damages that were granted is that at that uh, civil hearing didn't end until April of 1925. So it was over six years that the victims' families waited for justice in that case. If you want to learn more about if you want to learn more about this like sad and odd moment in Boston's history, I will as always include my references in the description uh, down at the bottom of this video. Uh, and I particularly want to call out uh, the episode of Mysteries at the Museum that covers the Boston Molasses Flood, the Boston Molassacre because it was the first thing that I saw uh, that introduced me to it, even though it is by far not the most informative, it does have some really phenomenal um, graphics, uh, some computer illustrations of what it would have looked like when the flood took place, which are really great. And also Mysteries at the Museum and Mysteries at the Mo Monument are just one of my favorite shows. Thank you again for joining me on this week's A Mystery and a Mess. Uh, check out our progress here, uh, a nice little before and after of today's mess. Uh, if you missed last week's, be sure to check that out too. Uh, it was the story of Catherine Hayes, and you can learn how killing one's husband could be petty treason and the weirdly overkill punishment for that in 1726. And come back next week for another mystery and another mess. Uh, please, if you enjoyed this video uh, and you like true crime and weird history and, you know, getting stuff done around the house like and subscribe below uh, and we'll see you next week and until then learn something new and clean up your act